Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part six of my UML2 video tutorial. Today, we're going to talk about timing diagrams. And here is a timing diagram just for you to look at. And don't worry, I'm going to zoom in and show you all the different parts of them. But the first thing I'm going to do is go into the analysis and how to figure out things like states and the different participants that you're going to be working with and the events and when they are going to be triggered. So let's get back into that, and then we'll come back to this. Now, whenever you're trying to make a timing diagram, the very first thing, at least that I do, is try to figure out all the different states for all the different participants. And if you haven't seen the previous parts of this tutorial, there's a link in the bottom right hand corner, and you can definitely check those out because that's where I got this step by step list of requirements for our computer program we're putting together. Basically, this is an ATM machine for getting money from banks. And what I'm listing here are all of the things that our ATM machine needs to do. Customer's going to insert card. Card's either invalid or valid. The card's going to be ejected. Card is valid. Customer enters PIN. PIN is valid. Blah, 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 blah. These are going to be all of the different states for all of the different participants in our timing diagram. And I also found that using timing diagrams really flushed together and made the whole entire process of creating the program very easy for me. So now that we have our states, we want to figure out what exactly are the participants we're going to use. Well, in this situation, I kind of dumbed this down a good bit. We're going to have the customer, the card reader, and the bank system that's going to have all the information for our customer. Then I'm going to take my customer and I'm going to look at all of the different states states for my customer. So I'm going to have card in hand, they insert card, enter PIN, select account, and select amount. See, I'm breaking down everything into all the possible states for this customer object, which in the future is going to make it very easy to create all the methods for this customer object. Then I have my card reader, which is going to have the different states of no card, receives card, card valid, card invalid, invalid amount, and other different things. My card reader is also, to a certain extent, acting as the ATM machine itself. And then finally, we have our bank system, which is going to have no card, valid PIN, invalid PIN, account valid, amount valid, amount invalid, and account invalid. So then from this point, it's just a matter of me taking these participants and putting all these states in the right order. And if you didn't notice here, they are pretty much in the right order right now. When the bank system first starts out, of course, it's going to have no card, just like with the card reader, no card, and just like the customer, card in hand. So we want to put all these states in order so that it's very easy to transfer them over to the timing diagram. And doing this also really helps out with sequence diagrams as well. And this list came from my use case diagram, which, like again, is in part one of the UML tutorial. So now let's jump over and take a look at a real-life timing diagram. And here we have our real life timing diagram, and I used UMLet to create this guy, which is free, and I'll provide a link underneath the video with both a cheat sheet, all the stuff you see on the screen is there, as well as a link to that free software. And you can see here I have my steps of execution right here on the screen. I just transferred over all of the different states for all of the different objects in my program or my computer system, and now it's just a matter of transferring this list over to this timing diagram. And you can see here I have my user, and there's a list of all the different states for it to be in. Across the bottom I have seconds. It's a timing diagram. It has something to do with time, so you should definitely put that in there. And I have this marked off as seconds. However, you could just have this be an unknown time sequence, and then just use T across the board. And it's very important to know that timing diagrams are going to be used to detail interactions based off of time. And with these timing diagrams, you're just basically going to describe when events occur, how long they take for other participants to react and how long it'll take to complete each individual interaction. And like I said before, a timing diagram is going to be made up of multiple different participants, events, and changing states, of course. And whenever you're creating these diagrams, you need to display your participants. And just like we did before, we're going to have the participant's name followed by a colon and the name of the class for this user object in this situation. And we did the same for all of the other different participants up above. And it's very important, especially with timing diagrams that if a participant doesn't add anything to a timing diagram that you should not include it. If it doesn't have major interactions there's no reason for it to exist on a timing diagram. And then as we float across here you're going to see how participants are going to change state based off of certain events being triggered. We can come up through here and we can see here on our screen now this is the card reader or the ATM machine itself and this is the user. So the user starts off with card in hand and then we're just going to draw a line up 
to insert card, and this event is going to trigger the ATM machine to change states from no card to receive card. And then what we're going to do is use what are called timing constraints to try to figure out roughly how long it's going to take it to change from one state to another. So from the time that the ATM machine receives a card to the point where it marks my card as valid, we're going to say that that takes roughly three seconds. And like I said before, time measurements can either be measured as exact times or on a relative basis. And if you're using a relative basis, you would just use a lowercase t. And then also you're going to see here that as the participants change state in response to these many different events, you're going to show those events and how they are affecting other participants by drawing arrows. So we have an arrow starting here with insert card up to receive card in the ATM machine itself. And you're basically going to know when to trigger these events by comparing those events to the events in sequence diagrams, which we went over sequence diagrams in the past. And that brings us to timing constraints. As we zoom out, you can see there's just a whole bunch of arrows going all over the different places. And this is the lifeline, as you can see here with this little note that I have here. So this is the lifeline in comparison to the other guys. So let's take a look at the different timing constraints that are available to us. If we push, just simply put in a lowercase t, which is the normal way to document time on a relative basis. This is just saying that it's going to take the same value as t to be able to complete this interaction. Then you can put 3t, which is going to be 3 of whatever the time unit is. You can also use less than 3, greater than 3, or less than 6. That's how you would document that. Or here you could show up to 3 times t, or you could get rid of the times, of course, and just put in a 3t or whatever you want. And then this is another way, or the final way, to show a time constraint, which would be 3, 2, 6, whatever the relative time unit is. But in our situation, we are using seconds as we showed way down here. And you're basically just going to block out everything on your screen and just show the changing states as the different events affect all of the different events that we have here on our screen. So it's pretty straightforward. And whenever you are arranging your participants, it normally makes sense to arrange them in the exact same order as they appear in your sequence diagrams. And you normally would create your sequence diagrams ahead of time. And there's really nothing else to it. You just want to pick your participants and you want to of course arrange your participants in an order that makes sense from the first interaction which would be the customer inserting a card and then the ATM machine or the card reader reading the card and then the bank system being called and then you want to do the same thing with your events which is list them from their basic state which would be no card, valid 8 pin, invalid pin, account valid, amount valid, blah, 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 blah. And when I'm creating these different guys, I like to create a couple different timing diagrams where I show best case scenario like we have here, where we just say, okay, they entered a valid card, they entered a valid pin, the uh, amount that they chose is valid, and the account they chose is valid. And then we could also go through the process of how things are going to change when things are not in their optimal state. So basically, if you just look at these guys, you're going to see exactly how to lay them out. And this is all that is really to them. But now I'm going to show you the alternative timing diagram, which I actually prefer to this guy. And here it is on your screen. In this situation, what we're doing is to conserve space. And I think to actually keep things a lot more tight and neat, what we're going to do here is just draw these little diamond shaped polygon shaped little guys inside of here and you can draw arrows just like you did previously if you'd like to do that and then you're going to use your time constraints in exactly the same way as well as your time units are all going to be defined in exactly the same way so i just like this because i just feel that it looks a lot neater and also i think it's kind of easy to see exactly when different events are going to be triggered and it's very easy to zero in on different timing constraints so there is a a pretty verbose overview of how to create timing diagrams. Like I said before, there's a link under the video. You can get all the stuff you see here on the screen on one nice little cheat sheet. Pretty easy to learn these guys, especially if you go over all the other different diagrams that I've shown previously. Leave any questions or comments below. Otherwise, till next time.